Southern Eye's Tengli no Genmup is a digital novel adventure game released in December of 1997 on Windows 95 and in August of 1998 on the PlayStation. The subtitle awkwardly translates to The Dream of the Turning Wheel King, and Southern Eyes is a long-running manga series that spanned the years of 1987 to 2002, incorporating throngs of extra media like two OVA series. If you want to learn all about it, including the explanation of the name, <laughs> please watch my previous video on the prior 1995 PS1 title, Southern Eyes Kusei Koshu aka Soul Sucking Princess. I highly recommend doing that because comparisons and contrasts will likely be made. <laughs> I will just say that the last game, uh, well, I didn't really like it, which was unfortunate because it was two whole discs long. This game is three discs long, uh, so hopefully it's better. Well, Actually, there were four, technically, because it came with a little mini music disc that had some songs sung by Pai's voice actor, Megumi Hayashibara. Last time, I said that the PS1 version of The Dream of the Turning Wheel King was published by the developer of the game, Nihon Create, but that is incorrect, despite the fact that some sources will list it as such. It was actually published by King Records, which makes sense because Kodansha, the very large Japanese publishing company, holds the license to the Southern Eye series. I got it wrong, whoop de doo It seems that in 2003, an updated version of this game was released on Windows XP and possibly some other Windows operating systems. That's cool and all, but I'm not gonna compare versions because I don't feel like it. All right, let's play Southern Eye's Dream of the Turning Wheel King. After an epic introductory piece that I would love to show in its entirety but cannot, we are greeted with a boisterous melody over the main menu screen. The beeps and boops and glippity gloops that sound as you navigate the menu are quite appealing to me. The options are fairly simple, and you'll want to make this change here to show text on screen. At least that's what I want to do. Another option here is the Southern Eyes Story Digest, and oh boy is it good. Set to the relaxing tune of summer waves washing over your toes in the sand, the Story Digest has a lot to offer. Through this, I discovered that today's game, Dream of the Turning Wheel King, is a direct sequel to the first Nihon Create developed Southern Eyes game, Sanjian Henjo, aka Three-Eyed Transformation, back on the PC Engine and other hardware. So I guess that Kusei Koshu, aka Soul Sucking Princess, has been retconned and gee, I wonder why. Ha 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 ha! I am a bad person. I will make I will enjoy making you suffer. Ha 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 ha. So this area allows you to get caught up on the story via a pleasant digital manga experience. You can turn the pages and zoom in to look around and it's all pretty great. The basic gist is that Kenichi, a regular high school boy, accidentally let this special little bug dude burrow into his forehead and cause a lot of problems. It turns out that this bug belongs to a race of warriors from Greece called the Kalgar, I think. And now there are evil people that want to get it, and there's this girl named Sujin. She shows up and kills bad guys, and Pai and Yakimo join the team, and there's that cool shot on the subway that I talked about last time. There's a part where they all get snowed in at this house, and then fake Pai tries to make out with Kenichi, and this gross thing happens before Yakimo kills her. There are these weird looking guys, and eventually the bug causes Kenichi to transform into some sort of creature who kills the main evil magic king looking guy. Why are the villains in these games so generic looking? <laughs> They're like campy bad guys from Super Sentai aka Power Rangers. Anyways, Sujin almost dies, and Kenichi gives up his newly acquired powers to save her, and then it seems like the story's gonna end with both of them going back to their separate lives, but surprise, they love each other. The end. There's also a character compendium where we get to see all the players on field and a page with a bit of information on the different ports of 3 Eye Transformation, which is really cool. It goes over the additions and changes made to each version, and it notifies us that the images used in the Story Digest are taken from the Windows version. Alright, let's get into the actual game. The story starts with Yakumo having a nightmare in black and white. 
And uh, there are two immediate things I should mention. The good news. Yo, these animations are great. Way better than the last game. There is clearly a higher production value here, and I'm glad to see it. The bad news. There is no text during the cutscenes, of which there are many throughout the game. They often relay major portions of the story, and unfortunately, I was not able to decipher most of it. Thankfully, everything else does have text since I turned it on in the options, and I was mostly able to fill in the gaps this way. So we get a nice little intimate scene between the stars of the show, Yakimo and Pai, on their apartment balcony before the moment is interrupted by a bloodied up winged lady from India. She is a friend of Gupta, who is a reoccurring character in the manga that started out as a villain and eventually became an ally. Anyways, this character, Sadie is her name, tells the crew that Gupta found a frozen Wu in the Himalayan mountains. This is significant because it suggests that somewhere a corresponding Sanjian Unkara exists. I should quickly fill you in on this aspect of the story, since I didn't really do that last time. For a major part of the manga, both the heroes and the villains are searching for the same thing, a third Sanjian. If you can recall, I said that Pai and Yakumo want to become human, and in order to do so, they need to find a three-headed statue called the Ningen. Well, that's just one of the ingredients to this recipe. A humanization ritual using the statue must occur, and it requires three Sanjian. The way it works is that two of those three Sanjian relinquish all of their extraordinary powers to the third Sanjian, becoming human in the process. Well, the third Sanjian absorbs all of the energy and grows immensely in strength. This tradition has been repeated throughout the history of the Sanjian Unkata in order to increase the power of whoever is ruling at the time. It's a gross act of despotism that often entails the ruler grooming underage queens for the sole purpose of harvesting their powers. During the majority of the Southern Ice story, there are only two Sanjian that are known to exist. There is obviously Pai, aka Pavardi IV, as well as Kayan Wang, the main antagonist in the series, who was sealed away by Pai 300 years ago after he went on a murderous rampage and killed all of the Sanjian. There is a lot more to all of that regarding his former identity and his relationship to Pai, but we don't need to get into it. Anyways, Kayan Wang has broken out of his imprisonment. However, he is now very weak. His Wu, Benaris, is acting on his behalf and ends up being the more involved villain of the series. So here we have two separate pairs of Sanjian and Wu searching for the same thing, but with different motivations. Pai and Yakumo just want to be human. Kayan Wang wants to destroy the world by regaining his powers through the humanization ritual, and Benaris is going to help him do it. This creates a sort of tug of war between everyone and causes major issues to Pai and Yakumo's goal. Much of the story ends up playing out as one of those wacky race around the world movies where both parties are trying to find and win over a potential third Sanjian. At the time of this game's release, no such third Sanjian had ever been discovered. It would happen later, but that's not important right now. With all of that in mind, you can now see the significance of Pai and Yakumo finding out about this possible Sanjian, and the importance of them getting in contact with said Sanjian before Benaris and his minions do. Thus, we have the main plot to southernize the dream of the Turning Wheel King. After a brief appearance by Lingling Ling and Steve, Pai and Yakumo fly to New Delhi and meet with Gupta, who informs us that the Wu melted out of their ice and escaped by busting down a wall. Here, we get our first interactive experience by moving a cursor around and examining things as well as talking to people. It is brief, it is limited, and it is all that this title offers in terms of gameplay. It makes up about 10% of the actual game, with the rest just being text on screen. Gone are the talk, look, and move commands, as well as the atrocious battle segments of yesteryear. And you know what? I'm fine with it. The last game was such a slog that I'm totally down with just being led along on this journey. This is more literally a digital novel. I also think it matches the original manga much more than Kusei Koshu in terms of how information is fed to us. Dialogue and visuals, rather than narration, make up the majority of it, and Yakumo's internal dialogue is there, but infrequent. Also, he's not a pervert. In the frozen tundra of the Himalayan mountains, Pai and Yakumo are led by a guide named Marchery to the cave where the frozen Wu was discovered. Surprisingly, they find the Wu there, who promptly beats them all up. For those of you that watched the last video, can you guess what happens when Yakumo tries to use a summoned beast? Yeah. 
The yet-to-be-named Wu keeps pummeling them until Sujin from Southern Eyes, Sanji on Henjo, shows up and cuts off their arm. The Wu delivers an ominous message in an otherworldly voice and escapes before the party heads back to civilization. Through a long bout of deductive conversation, Yakumo, Pai, and Sujin decide that the famous Easter Island just off the coast of Chile in South America is the next place to go. Upon arrival, we meet our tour guide, Tio Christian, as well as his weird, spunky sister named Maria, who immediately wants to get dirty with Yakumo. We have dinner with Tiao at a local restaurant where we are granted an unnecessarily interactive section. So far, there have been only two in the game, and I mean, they've already been talking the whole time. Why do I suddenly need to click on the person in this one segment to continue the conversation? The only other thing you can do is click on the food to get a brief observation from Yakumo. That's it. Tiao spends the whole meal telling you about the history of the island, and, um, <laughs> I, uh, I have a lot more to say about that. Uh, he certainly has a lot more to say about that, but I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. After dinner, they all go to visit Maneater Cave, where it is said that islanders had committed cannibalism back in the day. Inside, they find a crazy man making a fire, who is like, Rah! and then he pushes Pi down and runs away. They shrug it off and go shopping at the market. We get a humorous scene where Pi gets too excited about all of the food in the store and loads the cart up while Yakumo keeps trying to talk her down because he knows that he's going to get stuck with carrying everything in the backpack, and I can relate to both people here. The tour guide goes home and the other three characters check into their motel for the night. Sujin goes off to her room while Pi and Yakumo settle into the one that they are sharing. Oh la la, how risque! So they're just hanging out, and suddenly, the game does something phenomenal. Something it didn't even need to do, but did because it could. Pai is just lounging on the bed, and she's all, Hey Yakmo, I brought an unspecified game console. You want to play some video games? And then suddenly, we get a very fun and cute minigame out of nowhere. I was pleasantly surprised. It's called Jumin to Go, and it is basically a top-down, bullet-hell, twin-stick shooter, but without the shooter, or the twin, so just one stick. Regardless, it's a lot of fun. You can choose between Yakumo and Pi, who have slightly different stats. I think Yakumo has better defense and Pi is faster. You dodge as many projectiles as you can, while the level of difficulty increases. Your score steadily rises as you survive, and occasionally there are bonus rounds with falling chickens that add to the score. It's really cool, and the music is great. I couldn't make it past level 5, but I'd love to see if anyone else has gotten to some sort of end screen. Back to the non-game, Maria knocks on the door and invites Yakumo and Pai out to go disco dancing. So they're tearing up the dance floor, getting their boogie on, until Maria gets jealous and forces Pai to get really drunk so she can hang out with Yakumo alone. Pai ends up assuming the same toilet hug position that I have many times before in life and vomits her brains out while Maria forces a kiss on Yakumo and leaves. The following morning, Tiao, the tour guide, picks up Yakumo and Pai in his car to drive around the island. Let us now address the very odd information dump that occurs. The one I mentioned during the dinner scene. <laughs> For approximately an entire hour, depending on how fast you could press the circle button, Tio tells you all about the history and landmarks of Easter Island. It goes on and on and on and on. He tells you all about the historical events in the 1700s and the 1800s. You go to the Island Museum where the lecture continues and nothing of plot importance happens. He tells you about the people of the island, the slave trade, the agriculture, the current living situation, the economy, the tourism, the relics, the ancient scripts, the wildlife, the superstitions, you name it. He says it, but what he talks about the most is the Moai statues. My god, does he ever talk about the Moai statues. I sure hope y'all don't get tired of hearing about rocks, because Tiao has a lot to say about them, and you're gonna listen to all of it. And it carries over from scene to scene. You'll think the diatribe ends in one location, but no. It carries over throughout the whole trip. 
It got to the point of feeling like I was being trolled or something, like it was some sort of Andy Kaufman bit. Because you don't have any brains. You're from Memphis, Tennessee. All you do is plow the fields and farm and the farm and the... Uh, is that how you talk to Memphis, Tennessee, Mr. Lawler? Duh. See, Mr. Lawler, you don't have any brains. I'm from Hollywood. But instead of reading The Great Gatsby up on stage... Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to continue reading. <laughs> We get this long, random historical geography lesson. It's so oddly forced into the game, and I'm still dumbfounded by it. I'd like to think that the writer had just gone on a family trip to Easter Island and got really excited to tell everyone about it, but that nobody wanted to look at his vacation photos or hear about the touristy things he did, so he got really upset and he inserted it all into the game. Moving past all of that, Yakimo tries to blow a rock like a trumpet, but fails in comparison to Pi. They find some bones and a wiener dog before getting attacked by the suddenly appearing Wu. The Wu turns into slime, and then the crazy guy from the cave shows up to put Pi in a headlock. But then, the wiener dog attacks, and Tiao runs up and knocks the guy out. They take him to the hospital and they look at a map, where they decide that the three craters on the island represent a Sanjian, even though Pi insists that it looks like a sandwich. Later that night, when Pi falls asleep, Maria shows up and is all like, Oh my god. Hey, can you like come outside with me? Like I I just gotta show you something. I'm <laughs> I'm totally not gonna hit on you. So then you go out to a cliff and Maria takes her shirt off while she cries about wanting to be loved. She threatens to kill herself and then tries to force herself in Yakimo, but then Pi shows up and it gets awkward, so she leaves. The Wu shows up and attacks, and Maria jumps in front of Yakimo to protect him and there is an unintentionally hilarious use of a punch sound effect. But then she's injured, and then Pai is kidnapped, and Yakimo rides his hoverboard beast to catch up with Sojin, trying to fight the Wu by a bunch of those Moai statues that we know so much about. We get some flashbacks showing why Sojin and Kenichi, remember from Sanji on Henjo, broke up. Basically, Kenichi's mom and his friends and the customers at the job she picked up while staying with Kenichi all treat her like a foreigner. And then I think pretend Kenichi shows up and Sojin stabs him. Wow. Then she turns into a rock ball, also known as a boulder. Wow. Wow. Yakumo appears and gets his arm sliced off, of course, before shooting the Wu with the light dragon and Pai is still kidnapped and Maria is missing. Oh boy. Then we cut to Han, who is somewhere in South America fighting off stone beasts and a petrified beast tamer lady named Ebal to protect a girl named Chiche. <sighs> I guess I should talk about Han. <laughs> he is my least favorite character in the series and I avoided bringing him up last time, but I guess I don't have a choice here. He's a talisman-wielding magic specialist who likes to creep on women, and he's always talking about how he wants to have a Japanese girlfriend. He's a huge jerk to Yakimo because he's jealous of him, and there are at least one or two times that he betrays the main characters, but then they just forgive him and let him tag along. Han kept getting brought back and was a significant part of the story, but I can't stand him. He's such an annoying character with his stupid Yu-Gi-Oh hair. Anyways, he finds out about the other characters on Easter Island, so he heads there with Chiche. On the way there, he's rude to a flight attendant, because of course he is, and then there's a cutscene with a bunch of these bad guys, but I didn't understand what they were talking about. Back on Easter Island, Han blames everything on Yakimo, like he always does, and several new discoveries are made. Chiche thinks that the crazy guy from the cave might be her brother, who also happens to be searching for the third Sanjian on the island, because Chiche is sick with some disease and the brother thinks that the Sanjian can heal her. She says that Ebal, that petrified beast tamer lady, might know where the third Sanjian is. Also, Tiao realizes that he never had a sister after all, and whoever Maria is, well, she had planted false memories in Tiao. Fascinating. We've now made it to a proper disc change segment at the proper halfway point in the game. The party is splitting up and you can either go with Yakumo or Han. So thankfully the main game isn't technically three discs long, it's two discs. If you choose Yakumo, you put in disc two, and if you choose the idiot, you put in disc three. Needless to say, I'm going with disc two. What follows this point is a series of events that includes gigantic exposition dumps, familial ties, Sanjian in a cheeky Princess Leia outfit, Yakumo's useless summons, village people yelling, bondage, statue monsters, and more. 
Do they ever find the third Sanjion? <laughs> I honestly don't know. It was lost in translation. But I'm done summarizing the story because I don't think it would make for a very interesting video. I'll just say that the whole thing gets wrapped up with a very long cutscene that is full of action and excitement and misused punching sound effects. Southern Eyes Tenli no Genmu is, in my opinion, better than the other Southern Eyes game on PS1, and that's saying a lot considering that this one has virtually no gameplay aside from a minigame. The music is great, there is a cool character compendium that you can go through in the pause menu, the animation is really good, the voice acting is all there, and the overall story is pretty neat. The production value here feels somewhat elevated, and if you are a fan of the series, I think this one is absolutely worth your time. It just feels like you're watching another installment of the Southern Eyes story. I really don't have anything to complain about. I mean, I guess I can say that the pacing can be a little off, unless you want to learn all about Easter Island. Uh, I also think that if the developers were going to include point and click scenes, they should have done more with it. As it is, you'll go through 20 minutes of dialogue, and then when you finally get an interactive scene, the only option for you is to click on a character to begin more dialogue. This just feels unnecessary. It's not a hindrance, it's just weird. I think it all depends on what you're looking for here, but yeah, check it out. I do think it's worth it. Sorry if my voice was a little raspy in this episode, I think I'm coming down with something, but yeah, I, I noticed the vocal fry too, it's, it's annoying. But anyways, thank you so much to my friends supporting this channel on Patreon. Your contributions are beyond helpful, and they are a constant source of inspiration and boosted morale. Thank you a million times over, thank you. Be nice to people, bye.